SJC 13013, Oracle USA Inc., v. Commissioner of Revenue. Okay, uh, welcome council, uh, Attorney Weitzel. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chief, Chief Justice, and may it please the court. I'm Richard Weitzel, an Assistant Attorney General, and I'm representing the Commissioner of Revenue. If I may, I'd like to start this morning by pointing out two facts in this case that are undisputed and may help frame the court's analysis of the issues. First, um, the software sales in this case occurred entirely in Massachusetts. Hologic is a Massachusetts company. It downloaded the software from Oracle and Microsoft exclusively onto its servers in Massachusetts. And that transaction was subject to Massachusetts sales tax and Oracle and Microsoft, the sellers here, collected sales tax from Hologic on the full amount of the sales proceeds. And that was, that was in 2009 to 2012. Um, the second point is that years before that those sales took place, the Commissioner of Revenue had established a process by which businesses, like the businesses that are involved in this case, could apportion sales tax on sales of computer software based upon expected out-of-state usage of that software. And that process was established by the Commissioner through formal regulations, which, of course, have the force of law. And there's no dispute that the taxpayers here did not follow the process. They did not comply with the regulations in any respect. And the appellate tax board specifically they found- to, uh, They said they don't have to um, uh, abide by the, uh, the regulations. The regulations, their position is, is if uh, you are seeking to have you know, apportionment um, immediately, uh, you could use the regulations, but you, you could still uh, use um, use uh, the um, abatement in Chapter uh, 63. But I, I, I have a I have a specific question for you, um, if if I could, Mr. Wetzel. Yes. So um, if the commissioner never promulgated regulations, would there be uh, statutory right to apportionment under Chapter 64, age Section 1? Um, no, Your Honor. The, the, the right so to apportionment... the commissioner gets to decide whether or not there's a, an apportionment, and that's constitutional? Well, Your Honor, the statute is quite clear that it's a permissive delegation of regulatory authority to, to the commissioner. So um, may means may? May means may, that that's a power that he, he can exercise in his own discretion. Of course, he has exercised it here, and he did it immediately after the statute was passed. Not um, immediately. There was a period of time you could have apportionment, even though the regulations didn't exist. There was a period of time where there were interim rules in place, Your Honor, um, because it takes some amount of time to put in place regulations that can't happen instantaneously. So... There were interim rules. Those were actually put in place before the effective date of, of the statute. Um, but if I could, Your Honor, mention the word constitutional. And I, I do want to point out that in this case, the taxpayers are not making the argument that this delegation of power in the statute is unconstitutional, that that the statute is invalid or unconstitutional. Um, and I, I just want to be very the, clear. Thing, I think what they're saying, and you know, Mimiki uh, make the point too, is that vesting the commissioner with the exclusive prerogative to decide whether there can be apportionment or not when you're dealing with multi-state sales tax raises constitutional concerns. Well, uh, again, they're not saying that it's an invalid delegation because that would render the statute invalid. And we, and we don't think it is an invalid delegation. I, I think it's important to look at what the 2005 amendments that are at issue here um, accomplish. And in and, and big picture, the, the main policy purpose and thrust of those amendments 
was to uh, essentially close an enormous loophole that existed with respect to the taxation of software sales where only uh, hard copy or sales of hard copy software was taxable, whereas all electronic uh, transmissions were not taxable. And the, the purpose of the statute was to close that loophole and put everything into the taxable bucket. And then the statute does have a second sentence that allows the commissioner um, to promulgate regulations to alleviate or ameliorate that that particular tax burden. Um, and, and the commissioner, of course, has gone ahead and, and done that. So I think- um, But I know also, I, mean, I think Justice Lowy's question is, why is your interpretation of that statute constitutional? That is, if the commissioner has as his or her sole authority to determine rules to set forth the rules for apportioning and if the commissioner doesn't do that your position is or would be i suppose that it would be constitutional to delegate to the commissioner the authority as to whether or not apportionment would be required um be that is our position your honor and so uh, i guess my question to you is why is that position a constitutional interpretation of these amendments well, first of all, I think it's the plain reading of, of the delegation. Um, that, that's, that doesn't answer the constitutional okay. question. Understood, Tell me why right. the, it's okay to give the commissioner sole authority to determine whether or not apportionment of these software sales will be allowed. Well, again, Your Honor, I think, I think you have to go back to the legislative, what is, what is sort of the fundamental legislative policy at issue here? And again, that, that policy is to capture all sales of standardized software as taxable sales. And then- well, the, Massachusetts can only tax sales in Massachusetts, right? That's the whole point of apportionment. And that, the thing with software is that it's not a tangible thing. I know that, that, that the definition was changed, but it actually isn't, as a matter of fact, tangible. Well, Your Honor, it, it can be tangible in the sense that you can go into a store and purchase a, a CD-ROM that contains software. Um, I mean, I, I think right. And the so argument the CD-ROM that... is tangible, but the software isn't. But be that as it may, I mean, I, I guess my question is, why is it uh, okay under the Constitution to delegate to the commissioner entirely the question whether apportionment will be allowed? Well, because I think that goes into giving giving the commissioner some authority to essentially work out the details of how sales tax is going to work for standardized software. And but that's so now what, you're shifting the position. I mean, your position now seems to be that the details of apportionment are delegated. That may be okay, but whether or not to apportion. I guess my question is, your, it sounds like your position originally was whether or not to apportion is entirely left to the whim of the commissioner. Well, that is our position, well, yes. That's substantive tax law. The, sorry? That, that would mean the commissioner would be making substantive tax law. Well, I think I, there's I a distinct- understand, I can understand the argument that, okay, if you're going to seek an apportionment, um, then, then you have to use these uh, regs. I know that um, that uh, your opposing counsel would agree, disagree with that, but I could understand the position that you you have to use these regs. You can't get an abatement, um, and if you don't use these regs, um, then then you don't get an abatement. Now, there's concerns raised by that, as just as Wendland suggesting, because. I mean, you don't necessarily know at the moment of sale what the in-state, out-of-state ratios of use are going to be. Well, that may be, Your Honor, but I don't think that poses a, an issue as far as taxability. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is here, the software was downloaded onto servers in Massachusetts. There was clearly a transaction, a taxable transaction that occurred in Massachusetts. So, 
our position is simply in this case that in order to apportion, one must comply with the regulations that the commissioner has established to deal with the topic of apportionment. And those were established long ago. So the fact of the matter is here, the, the commissioner has promulgated regulations and that was specifically authorized by the statute. He's done nothing more than take the steps that the, the statute authorized him to take. And now what the commissioner's position is that taxpayers need to follow those regulations in order to avail themselves of apportionment. Um, and it's also the case that this idea that abatement, the abatement statute essentially saves the taxpayers here and that they can always come back to the abatement statute uh, fundamentally misconstrues what the abatement statute does. The abatement statute does not grant substantive rights to taxpayers. It's a vehicle for vindicating existing rights. And again, here, the taxpayers did have a right to apportion by following the regulations, but they didn't avail themselves of that. And because of that, there's- Can I ask you to address the argument that there are some uh, tax laws that specifically say, he shall not be entitled to abatement unless you follow this rule, right? That, that your, your, your brother points some of those out in his brief. And, and, and here, there is no such language. There are some tax laws, Your Honor, that, that say that if you fought in the corporate, in what's, what's been focused on in this case is in the corporate income tax context, there are statutes there that say, if, or regulations that say, if you adopt one methodology go, to start with, you cannot change your methodology midstream and try to do that through abatement. Our position here is that the taxpayers here never availed themselves of, of any methodology that was required by the regulation. So I don't think either party is putting a lot of stock in those sort of comparators, because I think here there was no there was no compliance at all, even to begin with, um, much less a sort of a change in methodology. And if um, your regulations, the the 15A through D, are the only means to obtain apportionment, then clearly it seems that you're right that you couldn't use Chapter 62C to for for an abatement. But their position is 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 not. Uh, the same. Their position is that that's not the only means to seek an apportionment. That's the means to seek an apportionment if you want it at the point of, of sale. Oh, but so so you're it's not that they misunderstand what abatement is. They have an indifferent interpretation of the statute. They understand what, 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 what abatement is under, under Section 37. It just gets us right back to the initial question. Well, Your Honor, I think there's also subsection 15C, which, which in the regulations, which discusses what happens if you do not follow 15A or 15B. And what that subsection says that in, in that case, you essentially default to another set of regulations, sales tax related regulations that say when property is delivered into Massachusetts, as was the case here, that um, regardless of the use of that property, it is taxable. So subsection 15C, certainly our argument is that it cl closes the loop on this, but I do wanna emphasize that there's a reason why the, the commissioner requires apportionment at the time of sale. Um, that's not an arbitrary <laughs> distinction. Sales tax is a transaction based tax. It's a point of sales tax. And it has ripple effects. I do want to emphasize this. It has ripple effects in other jurisdictions. When you, when you pay a certain amount of sales tax in Massachusetts, it affects your potential use tax liability in other jurisdictions, wh whether or not you get a credit. So it was entirely sensible for the commissioner to 
put in place a program where you have to make that decision up front, not years later where this ripple effect may be sort of unworkable at, at that point in time because um, it will be very difficult to figure out how other, other states are affected. So um, I, I, I think it was very purposeful by the commissioner as he was authorized to do under the statute to set forth rules that require apportionment at, at or around the time of sale and not at a later time, um, which would be- Thank you, thank you, counsel. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Cool. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Attorney Jones. Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the court. Richard Jones, together with Joseph Donovan and Caroline Cooper. Hold on, we can't hear you quite, we can't hear you very well. Could you maybe turn up your volume? Sure, but I apologize. Um, I did test the speaker in the microphone before. Um, let me try changing the microphone to a different. That actually is a little better if you just maybe get closer to the microphone and, and speak up. Sure. Is, is this better, Your Honor? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, there are three things we know about this case. The first thing we know is that both the relevant statute and the regulation provide for apportionment of sales tax on software that's used concurrently in more than one state. The second thing we know is that the sales at issue here were apportionable, and we even know the exact amount of apportioned sales tax for Massachusetts based on Hologic's users in and out of Massachusetts. That was stipulated too, was provided in the abatement applications. It is not disputed here. We know what the apportioned tax is. What we have is the Commissioner of Revenue uh, maintaining that no apportionment should be allowed. So instead of uh, a 30% apportionment for Microsoft and 18% apportionment for Oracle, Commissioner says no, pay tax on 100% of the entire sale. And the reason why is the commissioner argues its regulations impose certain limitations that prevent taxpayers from being able to establish the correct apportion tax through the abatement process, the statutory abatement process. The ATB below rejected the commissioner's argument in part because of the third thing that we know. And that third thing is that the commissioner's asserted limitations actually cannot be found in its regulation. The commissioner's regulation has no language saying that taxpayers cannot establish the correct yep. tax through the abatement procedures. And the regulation also does not say that apportionment is conditioned on the production of certain buyer certifications by the time the sales tax is due. There is an MPU certificate with the deadline, but that's a different entity because that leaves the seller to not have to do anything. So even if the seller doesn't give an MPU certificate, uh, the sales tax wouldn't be kicked over entirely to the buyer. Instead, what happens is it's still apportioned. It's just that the, the vendor is still required to submit the apportioned amount. And the Commissioner of Revenue was wrong to say, as it did in its brief, uh, that if you don't get either of those cert certifications, that no apportionment is available. And that's incorrect. Well, if we take if we take um, your your view, um, Mr. Jones, um, how how is the state going to be able to predict in any way or create in any way an an orderly prediction of what the revenue is going to be and have any sense? If they've promulgated regulations so that there can be apportionment. It's a public policy decision to say whether or not their regulations fit into what the real world of software sales are. And uh, if, if, if you can just wait until later and use abatement, uh, we're going to have a big mess. Well, I, I suppose, Your Honor, that could be said for any kind of tax that any taxpayer pays. If a taxpayer like, um, like like your honor, were to submit an income tax return uh, for Massachusetts that incorrectly overstated the amount of income, uh, you would have three years under the abatement statute to make a correction um, and you're entitled to that right. Um, and so that is a con that's the Department of Revenue's job is to handle abatement applications, refund claims, and the burden of proof remains on the taxpayer 
um, and it is no easy task to assert that proof. Um, taxpayers did that here, but um, we can't negate uh, an abatement right under a statute because uh, the Department of Revenue would like to have more predictability. By the way, I don't know if it really gives you that predictability because um, by insisting that if you don't get these certifications during a very, very narrow window, we tax you at 100%, um, that doesn't make things terribly uh, predictable either because we don't know who is going to submit the certifications in time or not. Um, in any event, um, the, the regulation doesn't have any limitations uh, for uh, uh, processing this through the abatement application. And I do refer to court- Well, to but the, sta the statute says that the commissioner may, by regulation, provide rules for apportionment of taxes in the, uh, in the circumstances here dealing with uh, software being used in more than one state. Um, your interpretation and the board's interpretation um, would allow uh, ignoring those regulations that the statute provides the commissioner with authority to promulgate. Uh, no, the, I, I don't think that's right, Your Honor. Um, the, there is a apportionment uh, that's made effective by the statute, and, this, and the commissioner is given uh, an option to issue regulations as to how to implement those rules. Um, and so those regulations are still good regulations. Um, what the commissioner is arguing in this case, um, oddly, is something different than what the regulations actually say. I don't think we need to come in and challenge that the regulations uh, shouldn't be honored or followed. Um, they should just be followed as, as they are written and not, um, it, not to have language imputed to it that would, wouldn't make sense, that would deny taxpayers a right to their abatement application or a fair ability to actually show uh, in a timely manner what their apportionment is. And I, and I did want to refer just to the Council on State Taxation amicus brief because they, they can address uh, the, the, the task that's at hand uh, with apportioning tax, getting the buyer to certify that uh, based on the users. The, the, uh, the, commissioner wants a 20 day window for that or you don't get to a portion at all. Um, and that certainly wouldn't have been the intention of the legislature in the statute um, to negate abatement applications or make it unreasonably unfair. Uh, it does call for uh, regulations about how to apportion based on use. I'd also add your honor that the commissioner's position about these time limitations, they're actually contradicted by the commissioner's own regulation that uh, it came up earlier, but the regulation does have this retroactive application. And it was noted that the regulation came out uh, in October of 2006, uh, and it was made to apply to transactions that happened previously back to April of 2006. So there's a retroactive period where the only way a taxpayer filing returns in that period could apportion their tax is by the abatement application process because the returns are filed. That's how it works. So the commissioner, when they enacted this regulation, uh, seemed to clearly bless the fact that abatement applications are fine to establish that. It's just a different position that we're hearing now in this case from the commissioner. And I think that's well, well, one their of the- position, the, Their position is that without the regulations, without the determination by the commissioner to have apportionment in these circumstances, that there'd be no right to apportion. That, that's right, Your Honor, and that's wrong. Um, I, I think as just as, as a matter of law, the, the uh, commissioner is focused on the word may in the statute. And what the word may in the statute, commissioner may issue regulations, that tells us that the commissioner had the option if of issuing regulations uh, of how to implement their implementation regulations. That's all the commissioner can do. It, and, and that's in fact exactly what the commissioner did. Um, it explained by its regulation uh, what methodologies can be used to apportion. What the statute isn't saying is that the regulations were for the commissioner to determine whether to allow taxpayers to apportion. The commissioner doesn't get that kind of authority to decide whether it should bestow upon the taxpayers on its own you know, uh, belief uh, to allow statewide apportionment one way or another. 
Um, no, all the regulations the commissioner authorized are implementation regulations under the authority of the statute. And we know this because we know the Massachusetts Constitution delegates taxing, substantive tax law authority. And what, what I mean by that is imposition statutes, exemption statutes, uh, law, tax laws that determine the amount of tax that shall be due. Those are for the legislature. The commissioner is a creation of chapter 14, uh, and, and it is, it, its authority is delineated in that chapter. And it says that commissioner can only administer and enforce existing tax law, and its regulations have to be reasonable, not inconsistent with the law, as may be necessary to interpret and enforce any statute. It's not allowed to um, uh, uh, decide on its own whether a tax law should be applied. It can't be delegated that authority. And this court has made that clear in, in other cases where the commissioner has at times been mistaken in its interpretation of this authority. And the court, this court in Gillette said, for this reason, the judiciary, judiciary has the power to review the commissioner's actions to ensure the authority is delegated and used in accordance with the standards and policies adopted by the legislature. So the statute only makes sense if we understand it to mean the commissioner is invited to make rules about how to apportion. It wouldn't make sense to assume that the legislature wanted to give the commissioner the power. But once they make those rules, again, I'm not sure I understand your answer to this question. So they, once they make those rules, why can you wait and seek uh, abatement rather than using their rules? I mean, we've got a definition of what tangible property is and, and software is, is included in the definition. There's not a separate section treating software differently. Why, do you, um, uh, why are you able to just not follow their regulations? This is an important point, Your Honor. We actually did follow this regulation. And, and that's important. The commissioner has argued that taxpayers hadn't complied with the regulations. Not so. There are two avenues to get an exemption certificate or an apportionment certificate. And that would have shifted the burden of proof. And that would have made their lives easier for these taxpayers. Uh, but because they didn't do it, they had to do it through the abatement process. Um, that's not disallowed by regulation. It couldn't be disallowed by regulation, but in fact, it isn't. And so we can't say the commission, the taxpayers didn't comply. They just didn't take advantage of an abatement certificate. Like there's uh, sales for resale certificates, or there are other exemption certificates. In fact, form ST12. Council, is it your position that the taxpayers here complied with the regulation by not getting an MPU and not getting the certification from whole logic. I don't understand that. What, what, what I'm saying is those are not prerequisites. And so that's, that's a key thing about this regulation. It does in, in the appellate tax board noted this exactly nowhere in the regular regulation. Does it say that uh, the production of these are prerequisites to a portion, uh, as I said earlier, the commissioner is arguing if you don't do these, you lose the right to a portion, not what the regulation says. Um, and that's why uh, it would be inaccurate to say we failed to comply, just as it would be inaccurate to say that someone who didn't give a sales and use uh, a resale certificate, for example, or an exemption certificate that's filed on form ST12, which is the same form used for the MPU, uh, they didn't fail to comply with anything. They just have to overcome the burden of proof of full taxability. And so in order to do that, we use the abatement process and we filed an abatement to establish our facts. And that's exactly what happened here. So um, the, the language of the regulation um, is important. It doesn't say what the commissioner is purporting uh, to use it for. Another example, by the way, in oh, Can you finish that thought, Council? What do you mean? It doesn't say what the commissioner is purporting to use it for. What, is, what does it not say? <laughs> the commission, the two things. It does not say that taxpayers are prevented from using the abatement process in order to establish the correct apportionable sales tax. It also does not say that the production of one of those two um, certificates that are referenced in there is a absolute prerequisite 
to being able to apportion. It does not say that. The one thing it does say is that there's a deadline for just the MPU certificate, not for the other kind of certification, just the MPU certificate. The commissioner wants you to get that certificate in before the tax returns are filed. And that makes sense because um, that's such a powerful certification because it just relieves the seller of having to do anything and makes it entirely the buyer's responsibility. But all that is is shifting obligations it doesn't have, if you don't get that, it doesn't have anything to do with not being allowed to apportion. So in that sense, um, it, it, you know, it, it is not, uh, the commissioner is arguing that you don't get to apportion if you don't do those things. The regulation doesn't say that. And elsewhere in the regulation, it's clear uh, under 15 well, The regulation doesn't say that, but the statute delegates to the commissioner um, uh, the uh, ability to, uh, a portion through these uh, regulations. And one has to wonder why the legislature would uh, give the commissioner that power to establish those apportioning rules and then have a different vehicle for the uh, taxpayer to not, to circumvent and not utilize those rules. Well, I, uh, Your Honor, um, it's common for the legislature to ask the commissioner of revenue to uh, do regulations that implement and provide guidelines. Uh, but there's no instance here of any circumventing. Those, if you look under chapter, uh, section eight of 64H, what you have there is exemption certificates and other rules, just like these exemption certificates. There's no circumventing. It's an advantage to a taxpayer if you can provide this uh, certification because the burden of proof um, of full taxability uh, as opposed to, you know, being apportionable, will remain with the taxpayer, the vendor, if you don't supply that. If you do supply one of those certifications, the department will uh, assume that it was properly apportioned. Um, but th that's not a prerequisite, and the law is clear, and I'll refer to D&H uh, Distributing Company, a case this court decided in 2017. The facts in that case uh, made it clear that even if you didn't provide an exemption certificate, um, you, you know, even after at the appellate tax board, you still get the exemption if you can establish it. And even if, uh, for Thank you, uh, counsel. I'm just, I'm sorry, your time is up. So I'm gonna ask if there's any other questions. Okay, I think we got your point. Thank you both. Uh, and we'll take our morning break at this time. Thanks.